at the core of all co coin games are the event cards that make up a, a common shared deck. All players start out the game eligible, and in a given turn for a card, which is the top card on the discard pile, you will go left to right along these symbols to determine if a player wants to activate and do an action. Once two players have chosen to act, rather than pass and gain resources or renown, and those actions are completed, the turn ends. You take the top card, which is revealed from the deck, and put it on the top of the discard. It becomes the active card, and you flip up the next card so that people can always see a little bit of a head. Sometimes an action that a player will choose is to do the event that is on the card. You have a shaded event which favors the invaders and an unshaded event which favors the native Britons and their Roman allies, the Duke's player. Additionally, on the cards you will see, as I mentioned earlier, these two symbols. This one here means that you have a momentum card and it lasts one epoch. This one means it lasts the whole game. And you have those markers to mark uh, shaded or unshaded once you place these, take these and claim them and place them in front of you. So what do I mean an epoch? Well, you'll have 12 event cards, and in the bottom four cards, out of a set of seven cards, you will shuffle and deal a random epoch card. This is a victory scoring card. Unlike other coin games, well, there are a couple that do this, there is the possibility that this epoch will trigger an event in and of itself. What's different is this one has a red requirement on it, so if the Roman Empire is fragmented already, this event will not trigger. However, if it isn't fragmented, then you will go through and at some point during the whole procedure of an epoch card resolution, you will have to go through and take care of this event. So this is really at the meat of it, the game. Additionally, some coin games have it where this card comes up and you get to know. Others, like this game, when this card is revealed, you immediately take it and swap it for to become the active card so that the epoch gets resolved right away. You don't have time to plan for it. Additionally, there are one other set of cards, and these are not always used. But each player will have one pivotal event card that has a certain order of trump that you can choose to play to replace whatever event card came out during the game. And if you do that, what happens is you replace the card and this card goes back on top of the deck to become the next event. So you can't bypass the event, but you can choose to time this carefully and you can say see I'm oh, sorry and you can see down here it tells you what players you can trump with your uh, pivotal events so the 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 Scotty player who is the green player can trump any player so if this card here came out as an event and then the Duke's player said I want to trump that and move it back this goes back on top but then the Scotty player could come in and say, um, no, I'm going to trump your card. And this goes back to the Duke's player. And then this event gets resolved for that turn. And there is a turn order. And if you note, on the top of each player's card, they are always the first eligible to go when their card is triggered. And there are also red um, requirements. So... The Saxons cannot play this if the Saxon were not, unless the Saxon renown is at least 15, which in other coin games means having at least 15 resources. Here we have the pieces that are played on the board during a game of Pendragon. Along the top, instead of bases, we have pieces that are called settlements. For the Duke's player, we have forts. For the Kiwitates player, we have hill forts and towns, and these have restrictions on where they can be placed, which we'll talk about when we look at the map. We have settlements for the Scotty and the Saxon player. Additionally, we have the, we'll call them regular military forces. For the Dukes, we have cavalry, and a marker for when they hire invading barbarians. 
for the Kiwitates player, we have their Komitates troops, which do not start in a barbarian invasion or full get scenario campaign. In play, you need an event to bring them in, and a Federate marker also for the Britain, the Kiwitates player. These are militia, so they're like the police cubes, somewhat in behavior. You have then two war bands. So if the Duke's player calls the Saxons in to help out, you place a marker on it, and that indicates it is his piece and not a Saxon piece. And those pieces can eventually build a settlement that would also be marked. Of course, during the epoch checks, if you don't pay money to maintain it, these markers are removed and their control reverts back to the faction, but they're not removed from the board. So you have to be careful on who you invite in. Control markers are the same as in coin, except that you must have a settlement of some sort in the territory you want to exert control in. If you don't have some sort of fortification, you have no way of establishing rulership over it. And if the Roman Empire is not in fragmentation, the Duke player shares control equally with the Britons. So these in the short and very long game don't start out in play. Down here you have these interesting pieces. They're, I call them helmets. They're technically uh, triangular cylinders. These represent the raiders that the invaders will send out. They don't move, and they don't count as pieces when determining control. So, what do they do? Well, on the board you have populations printed on the map, but those can be reduced or increased over time, up to a maximum of the printed value on the board plus one. So if there is a three printed on the board, it can go to four. But if there's a one printed on the board, it can only go to two. So these markers are used to show the changes in population. And these markers are called prosperity cubes, and they represent the wealth of the region. There's the, we'll call it the native wealth for the region, and then the Roman enhanced wealth. And these are top rows. So you most you can have is two cubes per population. Raiders, when they come in, will steal a prosperity cube and make it into plunder. Also through battle, just about any other piece can grab plunder. Also, you have the ability to eventually recharge these. And we'll see how these pieces work after taking a look at the map and getting into then how commands and feats instead of special actions work. Here we have the rest of the pieces, which are not used on the map, but on the score tracks and the various tracks around the board, and on cards. We have the oh-so-familiar resource discs. However, in this game, the Scotty and the Saxon call it Renown, and that has to do with the phrasing of certain rules so that they don't have to say resources excluding the Duke's player or the Kiwitates player. Um, you also use these as your eligibility markers along the sequence of play track on the board. There are four oceans in the game, and they are based on the campaign you select, either not patrolled or patrolled, and this has an influence on intercepting incoming raider pieces. Additionally, you have two pawns in the game based on the status of the Roman Empire and whether military or civilian government is dominant, you have different targets. They're printed on the map, but these are just to help show you more clearly what the current target is for these two factions to win before uh, the Roman Empire falls apart. Prior to it falling apart, you will be tracking the total prosperity, which are those gold cubes, of um, that is that is out in all the areas, and you will be tracking Duke Prestige, and that is their goal. However, once the Empire falls, you flip, and they start tracking control, and now they need control and prestige. 
And this is the marker here for that goes on the Roman Imperium track. You have the Britons who track control. They also can convert their resources into wealth that only they can use because when they are allied, the Duke's player can freely spend Kiwitate's resources, except when you have autonomy and civilians are in control and then they have to get permission to spend those resources. And then once the empire falls, they can no longer spend those resources. However, wealth is kept separate. And initially, Britain control is what matters. Oh, oop, I got the wrong piece here. I apologize. Britain control is what matters. And then you eventually get the total Britain controlled population. Just a reminder, but it's about the same thing. And it gets easier and easier. They need to control less population because they're losing control over the board. Additionally, when you lose population, these get put in your available area. These are refugee markers, which can be then used to build up population. Uh, these are just propped up on some population markers because of glare. As you can see, I have a lot of that going on here. And you have Saxon control. Note that... Um, oops, here we go. You also have the Scotty control, but these are map pieces, so those shouldn't be there. I apologize. So you have these final two pieces and they are used on event cards to denote whether they're selected for their unshaded or shaded event. Um, these are much larger pieces than it. Also these icons do have meanings. These are momentum cards and these are permanent cards. And I do believe I have both of these upside down, so they're supposed to look like this with the sails facing up. And, you know, when you gain a card, you place it in front of you and you place one of these tokens on it. And that, the, that pretty much covers most of the components. There's just one more thing left to cover. Very quickly, I realized I forgot to talk about three pieces in the game. The first one is a road maintenance marker. There are roads on the map, which can be used to speed movement along, and it can cost money at times to maintain these. And eventually, though, you're just going to run out, or Rome's going to fragment, and then these roads are not going to be maintained, and they will no longer be able to be used. So that was an important marker, and there's the space on the board. We'll show where that goes. Also, you have your pawns. You are going to get six white pawns, and they're not very large, and then four gray pawns. Yeah. And so the white pawns are used to mark commands, and the gray pawns special... Actually, sorry, my apologies. Feats in this game. And one of the big differences between other coin games is you must declare all spaces by marking them with pawns first. You do not get to place a series of pawns out on the map while you're playing and then choose to interrupt at any time to do your special actions in those areas and then finish out placing pawns and actions. Instead, you must fully declare your whole intent ahead of time and where you're going to do those special actions, and then resolve them. So that's a little bit different than the other games. Um, I'll have to see how it works in play, because I think it might slow down the game, but not by much, because players are normally doing this kind of pre-planning anyways. The final component you'll get in the box are these wonderful four and six sided dice. Yes, I said four. These are not eight sided. They actually have two sides of the same value. They're just less deadly to step on and they roll a little bit nicer. And they are done thematically with Roman numerals. So what are these for? The first ones we'll cover are the four sided dice. These are used when sending out raiders you roll to see how many you actually place on a coastal region. You either spend no resources and get to roll one die, or spend one of your, well, my apologies, not resources, renown. You spend one no renown, 
or you spend one renown and get to roll all three. So that means you'll either place one to four or three to twelve raiders in a spot. And remember, raiders don't get to move once they're placed. You have to recall them. The other aspect is that Roman, sorry, not Roman, but Duke Forts can also reduce the amount of units that get placed if, when we go back to these off-board markers, the seas are the seas are patrolled by ships. They don't reduce it if the seas are unpatrolled. And you get, remember, one marker for each of the four seas. Two of the seas are used for the Scotty to approach, and two of the seas are used for the Saxons to approach. The next set of dice we have are the six-sided dice. In this game, certain units have home territories. In these home territories, you can ambush or evade before combat, and that's something we'll get into. And when you do that kind of stuff, you roll these six-sided dice to see if you can see succeed. There are also a few other things. For example, um, if you remember, I said you have fortifications, and those fortifications uh, can have units withdraw into them when during combat. However, if the barbarians try to do a surprise attack, they can do a, try to do a coup de main, which means they bypass having to fight their way past the defenses and get inside a fortification, a, a town, or a settlement right away, and that's also done by a die check. However, the dice are not used for determining actual combat. And they're only to deter used to determine amounts of units placed and or whether a certain pre-combat tactic is successful. Okay, here we are. My game is all set up to run through the tutorial. Um, over here, I have the player aids that are needed for multiplayer. Uh, these have all the commands and feats for all four factions, and I'll go through that in a minute. And then you have the epoch round, and even more importantly, a very long and complicated detailed way to go through battles, and two very important charts for the two-stage battles. Underneath here you have a nice picture on the back of the rule book on how it should be set up, but you also have just color-coded, detailed setups for different scenarios, because only one, well, technically two, are shown in the back. This is for the shortest campaign, Barbarians Invade, and for the full kind of total history campaign. And then, of course, the playbook, which is going to have the tutorial, which I'm hoping to run through on camera next. Um, and also in there, there's a bunch of AI tutorials and what solo victory conditions are against AIs mean. And then um, Inside GMT had a whole series of articles on the design of this game. I like that they included it. I don't know, with it being available online, if it was worth the cost and the extra pages. But then again, they also include, you know, the full details in the playbook on the cards, and what I really appreciate as it tries to focus, is the background information for the cards, which if you take an extra long time to play this, you can go through and learn all sorts of details, including backgrounds on the different Epoch event cards. Then you have the designer notes, the non-player designer notes, Um, oops, missed a page here. Sources, and they have quite a few sources that they used. And they even have, kind of like old D&D style, recommended fiction readings. Here we have a map and it lays out a grid which is not printed on the map, just on this page to give you a rough idea. And then all the locations that you have on the map by name and then within here within it says it says it is bordering is in regular font 
and I wait for it to focus. Come on. Can you focus? Thank you. And then in italic means it's within, meaning that the location is probably a city, sorry, a town location or a right location or a uh, hill fort location. Here you have a guide for pronouncing Latin, and I wish I paid better attention in Latin class way back in high school, but I didn't. Yes, I was one of those who chose to take Latin. And then you, of course, have a, if it focuses, which it's really struggling with, Welsh guide, and that's where I'm going to really struggle. And then a spaces list on the back, credits, your list of force pools. Over here, I have the deck set up, the extra pieces, 10 extra wealth, so you have a total of 90 wealth, and all those markers that aren't going to get played. And then you can just see just how crowded this board is going to get as we do a really quick flyover, and I'll zoom in with some detail on some of this. But this board gets, with these prosperity cubes, fort markers, and troops, gets very crowded. And in fact, you can see cities are too small that they didn't even bother printing a control marker spot for them. And you can get very crowded quickly. And then, fortunately, it's not. There we go. So you can get very crowded very quickly. And uh, we'll go over some of the details on the map next. So first up, we have the legend, which will tell us what's on the map. And you can see you have kind of a mm, lime green, I guess I'll say, location. And this one in particular has a couple features on it. It's showing it's a population of three. And it's showing that it has a road on it. And it's a clear type terrain. Next, you have kind of a mm, more olivey green color and that is a fen and that is the home territory or favored by the Saxons and then you have hills and those are favored by the Scotty and here you can see the town sites have a black border around them and there's a indicator marker here and it says subject to tears of Eponia event so certain events have little icons on the board. Um, and then you have your city, and your cities only have a single prosperity track um, versus other locations, which are going to have two rows. So that's a quick overview of the details that you'll find in each territory. Okay. Here's a location that is on the southwest corner of the British Isle. Uh, here you can see the color from the key and also from the little graphics that this is a hilly terrain. You have your control marker spot and it's currently under Britain control. And the reason for that is you have a settlement in there to establish control and you have the majority of pieces since you have a militia there and a settlement. In this case, this settlement is a town. Um, underneath here, you can see that it is marked black border, says town, and over here it says hill fort, and it has a white border. Additionally, and this is a little sad, they use black background white text, which means you lose some of the scroll work that you can see in the black text, white background location. Towns must be placed on a town location, so you could not put a town here. However, all other settlements can be placed everywhere, with one exception, which we'll get to when we cover cities. Here you have a population of one, and it starts with two prosperity cubes on it. And when you remove prosperity cubes, you remove from the top row first, then the bottom row. And when you refill, you refill the bottom row, and then the top row. And remember, you're limited to a number of rows equal to population. And they do nice little artwork of stormy skies and a burning city to show you what the printed board levels are. You have the territory names, 
and then your settlement site names. This region has a border along here. They're not the easiest to see. The line is very thin. It is discolored. You can see them, but when you start getting to regions with a lot of pieces, it's a little difficult to make everything out. Um, however, you know, you have also the ocean, which is very easy, and it's obviously bordering the ocean. There's one tricky spot because things connected only by a point aren't adjacent, but things connected by at least some length of border are. Um, and I'll show you that in next. But you have here the sea locations, and up here you can see this sea is the Oceanus Hibernicus, and it covers pretty much most of the west side, and it'll have a marker in it that tells you that there's no ships patrolling it. You have a dotted line dividing it from the next ocean, and this ocean is the Ocean Britannicus, which is patrolled. Ocean Hibernicus is accessible by the Scotty, and Ocean Oceanus Britannicus is accessible by the Anglos. Here we have the lowland regions, and as you can see, we have a town location, but instead it has a Roman fort on it with some cavalry guarding it. And if you follow the border, you can see this is actually a coastal province that also has a rather prosperous town and a high population available to it. So it's a pretty important region to defend. And it has the portway, which connects these provinces. And when we get into commands, you will see how these can be used to march the regular cavalry and eventually the comitates along it effectively. Um, one of the catches, which we'll, you'll see, is that militia can only move to an adjacent space when marching ever. Meanwhile, if you're in the right condition and the roads are maintained, a, a Roman piece could, or a duke's piece, could march into one region and then immediately get an opportunity to march into another region, which could continue chaining. However, if you cross from one region to the other without a road, you can only move the one space. Um, here... On the side, you can see one of the other issues is that the cities are very crowded. They have no location for storing a control marker. You could put it off on the side, but I would probably recommend storing it on top. They only have a single row of prosperity cubes. There's not much space to put a lot of things in here, and it could get packed up very fast. London... I'm going to slide down a little bit here, is on this coast. And if you note, we're going to go a little bit further over. Here we have the divide between Germanicus and Britannicus. Both of these start out patrolled in this game. And you have... Um, the Saxons coming in from these two oceans. The other two oceans are where the Scotty come from. And choosing where to put your pieces if you want to see and read the names is, is a little tricky. And I don't know if you can tell, but this region here and up through here is where the Fens are, where the Saxons like to play with their raiders. And a lot of prosperity. And if you notice something else... There have so far, and there will not be, any Saxon or Scotty pieces starting on the board. Because this is immediately kind of post-Roman Britain, where the military in Rome is still fairly strong. And thus, they can't yet invade. Now, I'm going to really men mention really quickly, I said that you can garrison units inside during a combat. Most can hold two cubes. However, towns can hold four, and it might be difficult to see, but each city has a number for how many it can hold. So Londinium holds the most at eight, and the other city, which is 
Eburascum, Eburacum holds six in its fortification. And that one starts out the Roman Duke fort inside it. Well, this one starts out under the Kiwitates control. Here at the bottom of the board, we have the Kiwitates location. First, we have this not in yet in play section for their Comitates, their big regular troops. And they even remind you over here, by events, a maximum of 15 Comitates will come into play and you will start out with 30 militia. You have 15 towns that you can place and 15 hill forts to place out on the board. Okay, this is a little bit of a stretch for me, so if it gets a little shaky, I apologize. Up on the top corner, the northern corner, we have the spot for the Duke player. And you can see they get 20 cavalry and 10 forts, and those are all out on the board. However, for most of the game, you are going to suffer casualties instead of having your cavalry go back to available. Then, during victory um, checks, during the epoch event, the epoch rounds, a certain portion of those, depending on the Imperium track, will be put into out of play and the rest will become available again. So eventually it's going to be very important for the Dukes player to get some Federate if they want to have any kind of military force left in the game. But that means that they're going to need a decent amount of money somehow. They need a way to get resources. The Scotty and the Saxon player are fairly similar. And instead of having square boxes, they're going to have these nice banners. Down here, you can see the Scotty are going to get 12 warbands, 30 raiders, and they have six settlements to place. There is a reminder if this will focus. Um, that's hard to see, so I'll move these out of the way because of the shadow. But there's victory possible indicator, so you must have four or more settlements placed in order to even qualify for a chance at victory. You have a lot of raiders and a small amount of warbands. And over here on the other side of the map, you have the Saxon player where all the pieces don't quite fit if you want them nicely organized. You have a lot more settlements that you can place, but you still only need to have four or more. And you get 25 warbands, but only 25 raiders. Finally, let's go over the score track. You'll see, since the Duke's player can share and spend resources from the Kivitates player, they don't start with any resources. Nor do they, the Kivitates start with any wealth, nor does the Duke's player start with any prestige, and nor does the Saxon have any control. Up here, you have the starting resources, or apologies, renown for the two barbarian invaders and interestingly enough in each victory check if you are below a certain minimum threshold your leader is replaced with a new amount of renown so you're always guaranteed to have six or ten renown at the start of the next turn however if you're above it you just don't get anything going on up we can see this the first set of indicators for victory conditions for the dukes and the kiwitates players and then eventually up here at 25 starting resources is the Kiwitates player one. Going over here, this is the current threshold for victory for the Kiwitates player. And you note they're already at victory, but there's another catch. And they are going to get knocked down pretty quickly. If you keep on scrolling around, you have the track goes around, around, around... All the way down here at 75 is what the Roman Dukes player needs. And you can see then here's the banner on the board if you don't want to use the pawns. It would have been nice maybe to have those a little prominent or instead of pawns they gave you a blue and a red stick to place along the side to highlight which victory condition you need. And then finally 
we start out with 80 cubes of prosperity on the board. And that, remember, is tied to the Roman victory, and that's going to go away very quickly, just as the population under Britain control is going to go away quickly. And so that's the score track. Anyone familiar with the coin series will be familiar with this. Here is the sequence of play in Epoch Round track. And that shows me that I did forget to show a marker. And this is the Epoch Round marker. I like to put it face down. They fortunately didn't do double-sided text. That indicates it's not an Epoch Round. And when you draw a card, you flip it over and you have a summary plus a sheet to use. Here you have your faction starting as eligible. If they pass, they go down there and they gain some resources. If you choose, you choose which action you want to do. And then the second player can eligible can choose to do that action following. They cannot choose any of these other actions. At the end of the turn, those who acted become ineligible. Then the next turn, people will get to act. These will become eligible and they move to ineligible. You could have somebody choose to act and the other one pass, and then you'll get to a situation like this. Or you can have an event card played, which will make someone ineligible. And I like to do that by flipping it upside down to mark it. And then when you go to clean up, I go like this, this, and this. And that's how I like to mark it. And then, of course, when you're going through the steps, um, you pretty much will wind up ignoring this eventually, but this is just a good way to mark where you're at during it so you can track better and keep focused. And then we have in this game ooh, the heart of the victory condition for the Dukes and Kibitates player. This is the Imperium track. It tracks the status of Rome. And you start out with Roman rule, military dominance, and you have conditions during it for how it changes, what you need for victory, and um, what kind of units you lose, and what kind of money you need to spend to maintain your roads, or what kind of taxes get sent back to Rome. And an interesting thing is you have the wealth of the Kiwitates versus the prestige, or minus the prestige, of the Romans. And if it's five or less, Roman rule is implemented. And if that difference is 10 or more, so if you have 10 more wealth than prestige of the Romans, it moves to a civilian authority versus a civilian dominance versus a military dominance. And the catch is, during these four boxes, in order for one of those players to win one of those two players, the red player or the blue player, the Dukes or the Kiwitates, you need to have dominance. Mm -hmm. So at the start, blue can't even begin to win. However, during the game, most of the time you will decay. You will go from Roman rule to autonomy, and maybe from autonomy you'll shift into a civilian dominance autonomy, and then eventually you will fall down to here, which is fragmentation of the Roman Empire, and you have a totally new set of victory conditions for the two players because they're no longer really allied or working together. And then, of course, we have the road maintenance marker, which can get flipped to roads not maintained, and then the roads fall apart throughout region. You have roads going through all the lowlands and around and up, starting to get up into the north, and then you have military way along Hadrian's Wall up here, which is critical for the Duke's player to try to maintain these roads so that they can still move around rapidly and fight, and depending on in the uh, scenario, it starts out maintained, and they don't have to spend anything. Roman taxes will cover it. 
Rather than go over the commands and the feats in detail, we'll just go over them very quickly. Um, both factions have that are allied have similar types of things, and then they have their slight unique flavors. And so we first have the Kivitates player and their commands that they can choose from. They can muster, which this lets them raise troops and then possibly convert those troops either into uh, hill forts or even towns. And they can also, instead of getting militia, get comitates. And the trick is comitates and towns actually take wealth and not just resources to build. They can march, which allows them to move their troops, their militia, their comitates, their blue federate, and with an agreement from the Dukes player, they can actually move Dukes players along with them. Unlike other coin games, you can drop off and pick up as you go, and the nice thing about this then is when you go and you pick up in a region, if you didn't declare it, it sounds like you can then just pay the two resources and put a white pawn on it. And that's the one way you can break the rule of no uh, placing a pawn to declare an action or a command after you have started. Um the big thing that the Kivitates get to do is they get to trade, and trade doesn't cost them any resources to do because it's a way for them to get resources, and then it is their way in a couple locations to spend some resources to restore prosperity to the region, and of course, battle. Their special actions... They have rule, which is to amass wealth and promote civilian leadership. This lets them convert their resources into wealth so that they have something to spend. You have invite, which is how they raise federati auxiliaries under their command. And again, they have to be careful not to uh, be too poor so that when an epoch round occurs that they can't pay to keep them loyal. You have Reinforce, which is basically calling in militia and extra troops to help out in a battle. And finally, Pillage, because eventually you might want to, if Rome Fragments start pillaging your uh, neighbor, the Dukes, to get extra prosperity and resources and wealth. The Dukes player, instead of having the muster action, instead has an action called train, which is a very similar. It lets you raise troops and build forts. However, you can also increase prosperity equal to the population of the region, so that's, that's very critical for them They're for helping their allies out the Kiyutates. They, of course, have a march, and same thing here. They get to march their pieces, and they can choose to bring along other pieces. They can bring along militia and drop them off and then keep moving, or they can bring along the Comitates and bring those along a whole journey. And again, you're going to need a string of uh, friendly controlled territories in order to move through. You can't ride through a Saxon controlled territory. All the other factions are interesting, and this is different from the other coin games, in that they have some second way to attack, and for the Dukes player, it's intercept. This allows them to move and then immediately fight against raiders and warbands, and it says two resources per move origin space, but you can also stay in the same space and fight raiders there if you have the right conditions, and then you can do the standard battle action. Their feats include building, which helps them build Roman fortifications, and these are things they have to pay to maintain. They can also invite and gain uh, federate troops from the invading barbarians. They can requisition, 
as a special action, and that is to appropriate funds for military use. And you basically, um, well, it says here, for each of up to six spaces with Givitate strongholds, transfer one Britain resource or one wealth if the Britain resources are down to zero, plus all plunder carried by the dukes anywhere to your dukes resources. And then they have retaliate, which lowers enemy renown, meaning the resources that the barbarians invaders have. And then you get to gain prestige and prestige. Remember once the empire fragments is how the Duke's player is going to win. And prior to that, they need to make sure that wealth doesn't outstrip their prestige. So they may need to build some up that way. Another way that Duke's player is going to be able to build up prestige and lose it is through battles. When we get to the, discussing that, you'll see it's much more rich, like a full war game instead of the abstraction you see in most of the other coin games. While most of the coin games try to have fairly unique factions, sometimes some of them have factions that are very similar. And in this case, the Scotty and the Saxons, in terms of their commands, are identical in the name and almost identical in how they execute. The first command they can engage in is raid. And this is to place out your raider figures into a territory. Um, and then gain plunder and this is their way their their second combat option command because raiders can then after plundering immediately engage in a battle return is how you take that plunder back and make it into renown so unlike the other two players which have a way of uh, putting out prosperity right away or adding resources right away they have to send out raiders and then have them return back home in order to increase what they have to spend on actions. Then you have march, and these march war bands. And because they are sea raiders, they can also, if they're in coastal territories, move along the sea routes into new regions. And battle lets them just fight in the location like all standard coin games. And something I should also note here is that with Raid, if you have a settlement with a war band, you can place raiders in territories adjacent to it and not have to run the risk of encountering any sea patrols. The feats, two are the same. Both can settle, and this is using Renown to place war bands and build up settlements and add population even to a region because their idea is they want more population under con their control and the, again you need four settlements to win surprise is combined with attacks um, we can go into more detail on that but the basics of it is if you are raiding, you can go one area inland from the sea. And that's how you reach deep into the heart of it and of the uh, land without actually having any settlements present. Um, or you can use a surprise attack against a region and bypass, hopefully, the defensive fire phase of a stronghold that you're trying to take down. Now we get into the two differences. The Saxons can ravage the countryside and uh, basically Britain landowners and it's a way to grab extra plunder etc. And in battle they can form a shield wall um, only in field battles, though not when actually assaulting strongholds, um, their units can take twice as much damage before being lost. Uh, another big change in this game from, say, liberty or death is the fact that partial damage is just dropped and the unit survives instead of partial damage destroying the unit. 
The final thing that uh, we have are the last two unique feats to the Scotty. They can ransom, which is a way to gain extra resource after they plunder a region um, from an enemy and it's transfer of resources to their renown. And they can entreat, which is to convert Kivitates to Scotty in a region, and they can replace a hill fort and up to one hill fort and two militia with a Scotty settlement and war bands, respectively. So that gives them a, a way to encroach quite rapidly, making them fairly deadly. So, as I said, your whole point is to try to focus on achieving your victory conditions. When you look at the short campaign, the Barbarian Initial Incursion, which the tutorial covers, you have two epochs, and since each stack only has 12 cards and you're shuffling in the bottom four, you're, out of those 24 cards, you could have 23 of them, or you could only have 19 of them, of which you're only going to be acting able to act on at most half of them so you're talking you know what is that uh, 12 turns if you get the most number of turns in the short game to try to get as close to your victory condition as you can so the pros the duke's player needs prosperity prosperity plus prestige if the romans are at rule they need 75 total if they're at autonomy oops I apologize. I thought I had that focus locked. If they're at autonomy, then they only need 60, but they also must be at military dominance. When it fragments, then they only need prestige plus control over 17 total. The Scotty need to get 45 resources, or renown, their former resources, and four settlements on the map. Doesn't sound too difficult, but they don't have a lot of good combat units. The Next we'll actually go to the Kiwitates, and the Kiwitates need either 36 population under their control during Roman rule with civilian dominance instead of military, or 27 at autonomy, or 16 at fragmentation. And remember, autonomy also needs to have civilian dominance. So, as the lands kind of collapse and they no longer get to use the Duke's forces to help ensure control, their requirements for population go down so they have an actual chance of, of still winning. The Saxons, as we said before, um, need to have the four buildings and then they need a renown of 30 or higher. But they also have another one. If at any time, regardless of of um, where the Imperium is, because this condition only can be done as long as there is Roman rule or uh, autonomy, but not fragmentation. Once it fragments, they can't set up their own little kingdom. What they need to do instead is control 10 population in order to win, and that can be done at any time. So you you got to really make sure that the Saxons aren't settling the lands and building up population so that they can get an early victory. Now, usually in the short campaigns, and I, I have to double-check the rules on this, your two epoch campaigns, you play through the whole campaign and then check who has the victory margin the most, and... In the rules, there's actually a formula for quickly calculating these because it can be a little tricky as far as what do you add together and then what number do you subtract to figure out how many points you have effectively in, can, compared to your, your target. Um, so, for example, if this player had 47 and 4, I believe you'd have 47 plus 4 minus the 45 plus 4, 49, and you calculate a point total that way, and whoever in a multiplayer game has the most points at the end is going to win. Um, 
or of course you could have a situation in a longer game where one player might grab their victory condition, like he'll get uh, control over 10 population and nobody else has got their victory condition and he'll just automatically win. And here's the part I'm dreading the most going over, and that is battles. Unlike almost all the other coin games, even Liberty or Death, even Falling Sky, this game has probably the most complicated battle resolution. Why? Well, first, before you battle, you have some decisions to make. Raiders... Warbands, Federate, Comitates, and Militia, who are in a home terrain, have an opportunity to either evade or ambush. They decide beforehand, you put them into groups, you roll the die, you s compare it to the number you need, and if you succeed, they get that benefit in the upcoming combat, and if you fail, then they just act regularly. And on top of it, raiders, because they're massively irregular, remember they don't count for control, can even attempt to do this with slightly reduced odds in any rough terrain. And a rough terrain is any fen or hill region. Then you go to the field battle. The field battle is a pitch battle in an open field that occurs beforehand. So what happens there? First, if some events have a step zero that add this trap step where certain troops can strike with a with trap and they get to roll and apply their losses against the enemies and if two sides have this effect those two sides act simultaneously after that defenders have the option to withdraw into their stronghold and that down here we have the stronghold chart you have a holding capacity, which I mentioned earlier, where you can put two into settlements, hill forts, or forts, four into a town, six into Aboracum, and eight into Londinium. How you're going to mark this, I don't know. One thing I'm thinking of doing is making a battle board for this game. Then you finally get to go to step one. Step one is any unit which succeeded in ambush, or any cavalry which can charge, get to do their attacks and damage first. And these two sides are simultaneous. So if you have cavalry that are being ambushed, they're going to strike each other and inflict losses at the same time. Otherwise, if the ambush failed, then the cavalry can strike the raiders and apply their loss before you the raiders get to act. Step two, all units that have not fought yet except for raiders, now fight. They strike, and they apply their losses. And then step three, you finally get to harass using your raiders to take down your enemies. Then, if there are no units left out there on the field of battle, and you're an attacker, and there are strongholds still left, whether they had people withhold into their holding capacity you now get to begin an assault. And in the assault, if you did a surprise attack of feet, you have a chance of doing a coup de main, which means bypass defenses. Otherwise, you go to this escalade step where... Oh, yep, there's more. You have an escalade defense. Each piece times the escalade defense inflicts that many losses on the attacker. Then, oh, and I should note that each stronghold has a garrison unit strength that acts as a number of pieces. This is the number of damage it can do and the number of... Uh, then the number of damage it can absorb. So then what happens after you take the damage attacking the stronghold. Then you get to storm and both sides fight again, um, inflicting losses on each other. And there is no complicated do it in this order. It's just everybody strikes everybody because you're all in the tight quarters fighting in urban warfare or inside a castle. Uh, 
And what happens is if you have to check if all defending units, including the stronghold garrisons, uh, attackers are eliminated, then you get to remove the stronghold. And if that happens, then you can, if there is a second stronghold in the territory, move on to that stronghold and repeat this whole assault phase. Isn't that a lot? And on top of it, when you do damage to the garrison, the the stronghold of the garrison with its units being held in, you do the damage to the garrison units first. So if you don't take it down, if you can't do enough damage to get at the actual units, the garrison, the settlement is not going to fall. Afterwards you have consequences and consequences are just looking at how prestige and plunder is going to change. Uh, Did the cavalry of the Duke's player perform well enough to gain them prestige or were they humiliated on the battlefield and taken heavy casualties and failed to fight off the barbarians and thus are no longer uh, respected or maybe they lost a town and that really hurts them. Uh, or maybe, you know, you manage to take out a settlement and so you get a bunch of plunder off of the region. And finally, if all defending units evaded, withdrew, or were removed, the attacker may try to wear down the defender's stronghold and engage in a siege. And this is if you did not assault the stronghold and you have enough troops to, uh, match, let's see, what is it, the stronghold's capacity, the holding capacity here. If you have at least that many in troops, then you can start a siege and you automatically eliminate one held unit from the stronghold. Ah, but if there's no units in it, there's no reason to siege. You're gonna have to try to do an an assault and overcome the escalade defenses and take out the garrison that's in there. So how do you actually calculate anything? Well, if you're cavalry, if you're comitates, if you're a war band, you or a federate war band, you do one damage and you can take one damage. If you are a militia or a raider, you only can take half damage. There are uh, some other tricks and that is that um, some of these are dependent upon events and that uh, I'm trying to find it on here and I'm not seeing it really quickly now hopefully somebody spotted it well if a cavalry retreats into a fortification their field not field battle but they go into their into a to be, to assist a garrison, they get to have two uh, damage absorption capacity, so they're very hard to take down. And you can see here some of these things: garrison units are affected by events. And for here, um, this value is for the coup de main because that's a d6 roll, and it's based on holding capacity and how many units are actually there. So you have to treat these different so that there's always a chance of failure. And yeah, so that's the quick summary, not going into a lot of detail of just how battles are are done in this new coin game. Then on the back side of that battle sheet we just went through, There is the Epoch Round Summary, um, which I usually wind up using instead of the uh, counter on the track on the board. And you can see you have a a phase where uh, you have to pay for your Federati troops or their control reverts back to their originating faction. Then you have an Imperium step, which is about gaining wealth and having to pay taxes, and then you check for victory. Oh, and the military dominance and million dominance can shift, and the Roman rule can degrade towards fragmentation, though rare events will improve it. By default, it's going to degrade if you don't maintain things. 
and you check victory. If somebody wins, great. If not, then you check the Epoch uh, cards event. Uh, the, there are seven Epoch cards. Four are labeled early and three are labeled late. I haven't looked at the campaigns, but I assume that based on the campaign, you, you choose whether you're using early or late based on the setting and time period of that particular campaign or, you know, when you stack it, the four, if you're doing a full campaign, your four early epochs get shuffled up and put into the first four uh, stacks on the top of the deck. And then the last three are the late ones. Then now you get to earn money. Um, and again, as I mentioned, when looking at the track, the Saxons and the Scotty, basically if they're below their minimum renown, their leaders get replaced with new renown so that they have some basic resources to spend. And the Dukes and the Civitates player are a little bit more complicated. Then in most coin games, you have this upkeep phase where you um, get to cash in any plunder you might have, try to recover resources, and your um, you, uh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, then your, uh, units have to rebase to some place, you know, because they can't just stay out in the middle of nowhere. And first the, the Dukes player has to go through, then the Kiwitates, then the Saxon, then the Scotty get to be the last ones. Um, and this is where they get their new leadership also. Uh, then you get a recovery of the prosperity in regions, depending on uh, if Roman rule is still there, you get the bottom and top row. If Roman rule is lost and you're at autonomy or fragmentation, you're only going to get the bottom row. And then you reset any momentum event cards. The one with the sails on them get discarded and all factions become eligible and you finally play the next card, which was the card you thought was going to happen before the Epoch card got drawn. And I think that pretty much covers just a quick overview, sorry for it not being too quick, of the 20 and a half page rules that you'll find in the game. And I'm hoping next to do a run through either of the game what I call multiplayer solo, where I just control all the factions, or going through the tutorial in the book, which, based on some board game geek posts for the game, uh, does have an error, maybe two in it, but we'll see how that goes, and if I'll choose to do the tutorial or just do my own multiplayer game.